And, and what would happen is like, I'd get my ass handed to me in some way by some regular and I'd be like, damn, that was cool what they did to me. And then I'm like, I'm going to do that to them <laughs> back. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I liked having my ass handed to me. I liked seeing how someone could destroy me because it just made me stronger. What's up, everybody? Today we've got one of the most successful women's poker players and someone with who's displayed success kind of all over the field. She's won a ton of money from Heads Up Tournament Sit and Go. She's won about a million dollars at MTT. She's succeeded at cash games. She's played across all kinds of TV shows, such as NBC's Poker After Dark, ESPN, you name it. She uh, won the WPT South Africa. She's done kind of it all, including coaching and also working with business professionals and made a seminar, two partner seminars into acting as well, possibly some other stuff. Please welcome Melanie Wisner. Is all that accurate? Is that uh, a fair description? Yes, for the most part. Hi, it's super nice to be here. Thanks for having me, Dan. Um, the acting is actually something I did early on before poker and most recently, like what I did more is directing, but uh, definitely a, a theatrical involvement regardless. All right, well, the theater got in there, too. We'll throw in directing as well, a little bit different. <laughs> and why not add another a skill to the mix? Um, it seems like, uh, yeah, it you seems know like I you do, know You know doing. I do pole vaulting huh? recreationally. Pole vaulting? Oh, we gotta, we can't forget pole vaulting. Maybe, maybe you can, like, participate in the Olympics, too, while you're at it. Like, you know, just in your free time. You know, when right. you're not busy. Right. <laughs> No, I would have told you there's actually something cool that I've been working on that I would have loved to have told you I accomplished, but I just haven't yet. I'm trying to become the world number one in this uh, board game that I play online, but well, I've only made it to number two, so I can't say that yet. Oh, only only number two. That, you know, whatever. It's <laughs> no big deal. More from the world. There must have been something going on. Talking to you, I knew that you were quite intelligent. And, uh, like, obviously you've been successful at poker for a long time, but there's something to be said about that because most people don't stick around for that long. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about how you began. Uh, you started off in theater, uh, as we were just yeah. talking about, and, like, somehow poker got into the mix. It seems like a really odd transition. Yeah. Um, th though, for some reason, I've kind of gone the opposite way. Yes, you have. Absolutely. So, but how do you go... <laughs> so, um... how... How did this happen? So the the short version of the story is that my younger brother uh, was playing online poker when I was in high school, and he won like $50,000 online when he was 15. And I thought to myself, like, okay, like, <laughs> I could do that, clearly. And um, I played like a couple little things uh, in my gap year between high school and college. I went to, I was working at a restaurant on, in my gap year and someone invited us to a poker game and I just thought it was so cool. It was like all these guys in someone's like garage and it was like a little three table tournament and I won it for like $300 or something. And I mean, I did every stupid thing you could possibly imagine. Like I, I, I had four of a kind uh, jacks at, in, in one hand and in the middle of the hand, I just turned my hand over. And someone was just like, I didn't call you. And I still managed to win the tournament, which is, which is pretty cool. And uh, then I was just like, oh, clearly I'm incredible at this. You know, the classic Dunning-Kruger situation. And then I spent like a year and a half losing uh, when I went to college. I would just like put money online, lose it, put money online, lose it over and over and over and over and over again. And I had to like do these elaborate things to be able to play because I had a Mac and you couldn't run uh, poker stars on a Mac then. And you definitely couldn't run full tilt on a Mac. And so I would have to use my roommate's computer to do it. And she explicitly <laughs> forbade me from doing that. She like saw me once. She was like, you can't play poker. On, you can't gamble on my computer. And so I, I did this whole thing where I figured out how to change the name and the icon of the file on her computer so she didn't know it was there. 
<laughs> and then I would I would text her and I would say like you know uh, what are you up to tonight or where are you gonna be like maybe I'll come meet you I had no intention of meeting her I just wanted to know how much time I had to play online poker so that's how I would like spend my weekends in college and then um, I eventually uh, moved dorms and there was a group across the hall from me th- these three guys who I played poker with all the time and they let me use their computer all the time and they thought I was just like such a boss <laughs> and so it, it kind of took off then. And uh, I started doing well, like I started kind of like going deep, right? But I, cu- I couldn't like really break through. Uh, like I-, I hear this all the time from my students and clients, like, you know, I-, I make it so far, but I just like don't make the final table. That was what, hap- that was, what was happening to me. And um, Kevin Saul, who was like this, you know, idol of mine online at the time, uh, posted this uh, thread on Pocket Five. So I wonder if like anybody could find it in the archives. And it was called Hands from My MTTs on Stars Tonight. And he was posting them live. And so he was from like, you know, four different tournaments he was playing. And I remember reading this and thinking like, okay, that's what he's doing. That's why, that's why this works. Like, that's why this aggression works. This is so cool. And I was, be- I was too, you know, stereotypically conservative at the time. And so seeing someone uh, execute a really high... Uh, a high level, super aggressive caliber of play kind of brought me right where I needed to be in the middle. And from then on, I just like started winning everything. And I like didn't look back. I like every tournament I ever wanted to win on stars, I won. Like the the holy grail for me, do you remember like back in the day? I don't know, did you ever play tournaments on Poker Stars? I did, yeah. I can't say that I had much success in MTTs on Poker Stars. <laughs> Although I can see how, especially if you're unknown, like being quite aggressive would work pretty well against oh, yeah. most people. Well, I would like watch, um, you know, those like, high stakes, the cash games. I would watch them and like Hollingall and like all those guys. I would like watch and be like, oh my God, that's so cool. I'd like read these hand histories of all these people playing like super high stakes. And um, so I like wanted to get there. I just didn't know how. And then I got to sort of see it. Um, but like, I remember thinking when I when I first started playing, I was like, oh my God, I want to I want to win the 11 rebuy. Like, I want to win that tournament. Like, that was the... <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, like, first, pra- first prize is like, you know, 13 or 14K in that thing. And I remember winning it. It was a huge field. It was like a couple thousand people every time. And I won it multiple times. And I, I went to... Uh, and I, on my, in my junior year of, of college was like when it started really taking off. And my roommate thought I was just making the whole thing up. She was like, you don't... There's no way anyone really wins money at poker. And the first night that we were together in the dorm I won the 11 rebuy for like the second time for like 14k or something and she was just like oh my fucking god so um and then what what really sort of catapulted it was there was a tournament with frequent play it was it was the entry was frequent player points you're getting like a side of the story I never tell anyone by the way so this is really funny um and it was called the the turbo (laughs) it was called the turbo takedown and so it was like 3,000 or 5,000 FPPs and you would win it and it was a million or you'd, en- you'd enter with that and it was a million dollar prize pool. And I final tabled this tournament and um, we were three handed and it was like 40K, 60K, 100K, something like that. And we were, we sat out, we were waiting for a deal and no one ever came because it just so happened the Sunday million or the Sunday warm up one of them was in was in talks at the same time so whatever host was available was there so no one ever came we blinded we just like traded blinds around for like almost an hour and then one of the guys just like was like Fuck this and started playing after we were now we're like 10 big blinds deep effectively and i of course took third which was great like 40k was like life changing money um and i was like 20 years old but i remember emailing poker stars because i was like they sh- they owe us something for not coming like my equity would have been this i would have had another seventeen thousand dollars whatever and i got this whole email back from poker stars saying basically no f- off um but here's a here's a here's a ticket to the sunday millions so you can put your obvious tournament skills to use <laughs> and so that's kind of how that was kind of like the whole story and then um i sort of started learning about the whole live world and I went to Atlantic City for the first time right after I turned 21, and I played some little tournament at the Taj Mahal. And I remember everyone talking around me um, about their screen names online. And I was like, oh my God, I know you guys. Like, I've played with you and you and you. And they were like, who the hell are you? And I told them my screen name, and the jaws just like successively dropped. And they're like, oh my God, you're a girl? And it was a whole, it was a whole thing. And I learned about like the tour, and I really liked these people that I had met. And they were all just so smart and interesting and, and like, just 
you know, poker brings a lot of unique characters. So then I went to my first EPT and then I won the ladies event there and I was just like super hooked. I love travel, I love food. I wanted, I loved poker and I just like decided I'm going to do that. Musical theater just like fell to the side and uh, that's kind of how it happened. Well, that's a hell of a story. Much I know, more right? colorful than most poker p- players' stories. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like you entered poker through MTTs, right? And I guess from there you went to Heads of Sit and Goes? Yeah. So so what happened was I think I like messed around on like 25 cent, 50 cent cash when I first started playing online. Mm-hmm. I won this $20 tournament for a couple hundred bucks, like I said. And then... Uh, And then that, and then I started playing tournaments, which was just really cool. It appealed to me because, you know, for the reason any noob wants to do anything, because you can win a lot of money for a tiny amount, right? But I I also really liked the the leveling up of dynamics. I liked that um, excitement that kind of came along with it. I liked the pressure you could put on people. I kind of like this idea of accumulating every chip in a tournament for yourself. I thought that was very cool. And then... What what really came out of that was I wanted to play more hands, but I couldn't uh, and still do well. So I, <laughs> I decided I decided let's try heads up sit and goes. And th- it actually really supported my game because I was able to play way more hands. And so in heads up pots in tournaments, I felt like I, I really knew what I was doing more because I had seen so many hands. And then on its own, I just loved that like one on one attrition. And I felt like I felt like I got so much better faster playing heads up because I would like move up to the next level. You know, I, I was playing like whatever hundred dollar heads up sit and goes, and then I'd move up to two hundreds, and like everyone is so good, and I'll, I learn like the regulars' names and who they are, and like I remember like specific things. Like, I had so many aha moments, you know, in my game. Like, of course, the game is the game state is much different now, but I remember when I learned about thin value betting. And then I learned how to take advantage of thin value bidding. And I, I learned like what lines people would do with it. And and what would happen is like I'd get my ass handed to me in some way by some regular. And I'd be like, damn, that was cool what they did to me. And then I'm like, I'm going to do that to them <laughs> back. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I liked having my ass handed to me. I liked seeing how someone could destroy me because it just made me stronger as a player. And then I could do it back or I could learn a creative way to exploit what they were doing. And so that sort of really cool thing happened all the time when I was going up in, in Heads of Sin Goes until I got to like, you know, the, the level below the top on Poker Stars. And that was where, like, Liv B and um, uh, what was his name? Uh, oh, my God. Olivier, maybe? Bousquet? Yeah, well, him. Yeah, Liv B, but a couple of other people who were, like, playing the 1Ks and the 5Ks on, on Stars. And I was like, oh, my God. Like, they're the best in the world. And then I and then I got sponsored by Full Tilt. And I, I, I started open sitting the highest stakes on there, which was, like, a huge, you know... I, we're just playing this dumb little video game online, but it feels like you've mastered the world when you're when you're doing that. And so I would sit there on, on full tilt and I'd have my little custom avatar of like this, you know, I was in like this little green shirt with the red hair and all like the different expressions I could I could make. And um, you know, I would just I would just battle whoever came my way and, and some of them would be other red pros and some of them would be you know, randoms or whatever. Um, and I didn't really play a lot of the other regulars because we had all we had all known each other for so long and, and most of the regulars just like didn't sit each other. So, but I, mm-hmm. I got, I, I remember that, that Heads Up gave me like this pure kind of satisfaction of like demolishing my opponent and also helped me just play more hands so I could just get better quicker. So that was, that was kind of what happened. It, it, it I ended up moving away from it because I wanted to play live more and there, you know, there's only like one heads up tournament per tour stop. So it wasn't like, it didn't make sense to focus on that so much. But I, I mean, I grinded heads up. That was like how I, how I made most of my money for a long time. That is pretty interesting that it, uh, it maybe accelerated your learning. Uh, it makes me, it for gives sure. me the idea. I mean, I knew that the idea of playing online will definitely accelerate people's learning quite a lot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and well, that's how our generation outpaced everyone before, right? Yeah, mostly. I mean, there was some live stuff going on where people had their emotions in play and all that, where the online guys didn't think about all that stuff and live tells and and whatever Some of them nonsense. still don't. And then, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's different. It's I mean, there's some stuff to it, obviously. But I never thought of using Heads Up as like a way to get better at the other games. 
I mean, I'm sure you could see like more like of the psychology of what's going on, and more of like how what you can get away with when you're playing with people and that kind of thing. Whereas mm-hmm. if you play ring, it's really hard to see that at least at first. I think Would you that, say that's what happened that you, with you. Yeah, I I think that you have to have a certain level under your belt before you can kind of like navigate in and out of that because. Uh, the the ranges are vastly different. The 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 average hand strength at the river is vastly different. The the way you want to maneuver is different. Like you're the small blind and the button. Like all all of that is 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 unique to to heads up. But I think you get a really good sense of what people like to do and how they feel about their hands. Even though it's it's a little bit of a it, it's like a parallel dimension. You know, it's not one to one translatable mm-hmm. to to MTTs, but you get a sense, you really get a good feel. You see like what people do when they're strong, what people do when they want you to think they're strong. Like all of those kind of like logic, like, like the, the, the biggest thing for me when I first learned poker was, okay, I have to compare what someone is doing, what, what, what they're representing to what they'd really be doing if they had the hand they're representing and, and, and learning how to combine those two things. And, and that was very helpful because even though, you know, the hands weren't the same, I wasn't like raising King deuce off and someone calling me with queen three, like, like nothing was, was happening like that, but I could tell when people were uncomfortable, I could tell what, what put people in difficult spots. I could tell when people were legitimately strong, like all, all that stuff was, was very helpful because you play, you know, almost every hand and that's, and it, it, maybe it was a little bit too of like ADD, just being too bored, folding so much. Um, but I, I think I think once you have a, a decent level under your belt and you can you you get the idea of the transition, absolutely, you could practice there. I will say that everyone's really good now at heads up, sit and goes. Like I, I went, I like years later after I was like done grinding. I remember going on full tilt and like so I used to sit the one Ks and I just wanted to mess around at like a, like the one hundreds or two hundreds. And I was like, what? <laughs> These guys are so good. They would have, they would have, it's unbelievable how good everybody has gotten. So the games are, are quite tough, but maybe at, you know, low, super low levels, they're still fun and useful for that. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering that myself because like nowadays, if like someone just like looks up where the solver's at, they can yeah. play reasonably well if they put in the work. Yeah. Like, now they have to what do you, what do you think are you levels. do you like it more now as you like go deeper into solutions or did you prefer when it was just kind of like figuring it out and the the smartest person would win and like the cleverest person would win that kind of thing um i think i definitely preferred the former for all sorts of reasons at least yeah at least the at first former. but now sort of the wow. game has changed yeah, uh, where you mean the, the solvers didn't. You mean the ladder? Uh, yeah, excuse me, the ladder. That's what I meant to say. You're right. Where yeah, there's a lot more value on the table because it's just a matter of the the way of this economy of poker, where inevitably, if we just look at things from a purely um, skill technical standpoint, there's going to be diminishing returns as more people become better and better. So now the game has to change in a different direction. This is the whole reason why I start dressing up, doing goofy stuff, because, you know, like to me, all of this has sort of become like, okay, I can just like look this up in a computer and like figure out the rough principle and that that's like it. That doesn't sound like a whole lot of fun to me versus yeah, the actual battle thing and like that. maybe there's something that. more to the game. Um, I mean, I could think of some, some things that could be worked and maybe there's some like hard exploits, but it's like there's still diminishing returns on the time and effort. And now there's like high rake and whatever, and you gotta like fade that. Um, but to me, it's more exciting to pursue the creative avenues because those are really open ended, and you can do all kinds of stuff. There's more laughing involved, and uh, you know people are less serious, and you don't have to battle a bunch of robots. So. Yeah. And you clearly unravel yeah. people's games. You know, I I won't mention any names, but but you've definitely put put people off their games at some some certain final tables, maybe mistakes that should have never been made by your opponents. Like what? Like what? I don't know. Limit limit Hold'em comes to mind. (laughs) (laughs) Well, when magic is afoot, um, (laughs) yeah, when magic's afoot, things things are a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Uh, Once magic enters the picture, Mm. (laughs) all of a sudden... All bets are off, yeah. um, (laughs) 
<laughs> magic, the psychology of magic sounds like a book or <laughs> some kind of topic that could be on a YouTube channel. Um, but uh, yeah, what you're saying is really interesting because definitely um, all of what you're talking about seemed to be a lot of what a lot of players lacked when I was looking at them myself and trying to like help people become better at the game or thinking like what could actually be useful for people to become better at the game. But it does make a lot of sense that if you're like battling someone heads up who doesn't have a solid foundation of game theory and doesn't know, okay, I'm going to just always call these hands or whatever and have this game plan, then yeah, you can like find like pretty big exploits and then exploit them pretty hardly or pretty strongly. I mean, I imagine you use this a bit in your coaching or do you? Um, because yeah. I know you help people get over emotional problems and you help people, you coach people in all kinds of ways. It sounded like from talking. Yeah. To so I, I really like to focus on mental game. And, um, aside from this, I've actually, I have some friends that are, um, pretty big, uh, trading, especially like crypto and like nobody in the trading world ever talks about mental game, which is like astounding to me because it's, in the exact same thing, if not exacerbated. But um, I think that that mental game is really what separates the good from the great players. And I think that in in my own career, I can I can think of moments that like would have given me huge swings had I been able to get my mental game to the place that I really wanted at the time. And so I've done a lot of thinking about it and reflecting, and and I've I've sort of made that a big focus of of my coaching because I think, and I also think it's just like. Oh, it's very valuable to people because I, I, I think that everyone can find range charts online and and it, it's more it's more interesting to me and I think I can provide more value helping people get out of their own way whereas many people can teach you you know the basic technical elements of poker um, I also I also noticed that for a long time and maybe it's still kind of the case there there tended to be this big stigma about tilt like no one would admit they tilted. Um, tilt was something that non-professionals did, right? Like a, a professional would always have everything under control and a, a professional would be simply immune to the ill effects of emotions at the table. And what I learned is that is that, that isn't true at all. And that was that that narrative was doing a big disservice to players because the the key is not that you never suffer. The key is that you're not ever suffering or not ever compromised, but that you basically never play when you are or you have a strategy to immediately take you out of that state rather than what a lot of people a lot of my peers did which was basically just say that they weren't tilting or like ignore it completely and no one ever did any work on that um so that that's a big part of what i of what i like to focus on and and i think that in this day and age as well with the kind of inundation of information that people have uh you know you can watch a stream here it's all and you can do this there like you don't you don't necessarily have the ability as a as like a casual or recreational or even like semi-pro player to separate the wheat from the chaff and so people end up getting all of these pieces of data into their game without it being built on any kind of foundation. And you'll you'll see this all the time. Like I, I have a joke with a good friend of mine about how people are just like these slot machines of poker terms and they just run the crank and like three different terms <laughs> come out and they like say a sentence about it. Um, so so I kind of I kind of like to rebuild people's thought processes from scratch because I, I really feel like if you have a high fidelity, high quality thought process that you can kind of always count on, then it doesn't really matter what situation you've found yourself in, because who can possibly practice however many trillions of hand situations there are, but you can navigate through any set of variables that you find yourself in. So that's kind of the basis of my approach to, to coaching. Okay. Can you give some more examples of how you deal with different personality types in poker? Yeah. Um, like how what the remedies would be for certain problems that you've seen because like I've never heard of anyone really doing dealing with this except perhaps yeah. Tommy Angelo and other mindset coaches. Ugh, but... Tommy Angelo, be still my heart. I love that book so much. Um, <laughs> yeah. So the way I like to think about it, I mean, I really draw upon my own experience um, to sort of extrapolate from for this kind of stuff. Um, but I I believe that the version of yourself that is compromised. And, and I think everyone can relate to this, whether it's in poker or out of poker, you're in the heat of the moment, you said something you didn't wanna say, you realize the perfect thing 
two hours later that you should have said like you're you're not exactly yourself and that's because hormones are pumping through your body and, and everything else um but the version of you that is calmly discussing and analyzing right now just as we are is not the same version as when you're compromised and so it would be crazy to assume that that version of yourself will behave the same way under the same logical and reasonable constraints that that your calm sure. analytic self would be and sure. the the uh analog i like to use is someone who's decided oh you know i really want to eat healthy and i want to get in shape and whatever but they buy junk food at the grocery store and keep it in their house and they think oh you know i won't <laughs> i won't touch that but they're creating a situation where the you know weak version of themselves is now unprotected you know what I mean? Rather than creating a situation in advance where the weak version of themselves are protected. And so that's kind of uh, that's kind of like the underlying principle and like the base analogy I like to give. I, I, I have people talk about, and I, and I also will say this is incredibly difficult because a lot of people do not like to kind of dive deep in, in this way and, and peel back the layers of their weaknesses and, and it's uncomfortable. And, and they also, tend to skew towards wanting to impress their coach, whether it's me or someone else. They want praise and, and good feedback and, and there's oh, a relationship there. So it's, it's a, it, it can be, I, I have to tell, I have to tell people that my, that it's not my job to make you, you know, feel good about yourself. It's my, it's my job to kind of rip you to shreds a, li a little bit and build you back stronger. And so I, I find that 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 making sure people understand that and and giving them a way to get comfortable with that is is really key. Otherwise, people are kind of just operating as the version of themselves that they want to present that they want, you know, it, it happens in all sorts of ways, like people will just leave out hands that they played really badly because, you know, oh, well, I know why I did that oh, and man. blah, blah, blah. Uh -oh. So you have to make sure that, that people are comfortable exposing their true selves to you. And then you can get hmm. more granular with it. You can you can say things like, well, um, in, in what ways do you find yourself becoming weak? Like for some people, it's they become too loose. For other people, they get, you know, distracted. They have like, um, I think, um, what's his name? Uh, Jared Tendler, I can't believe I just said what's his name about him, um, has a really great part of his book, The Mental Game of Poker, where he talks about all the little types of tilt. He's like, there's finger tilt, there's injustice tilt, there's hate losing tilt, there's there's uh, entitlement tilt, there's every little thing and there's every way that it manifests. And people are just like, oh, well, I'm not tilting if I'm not you know, going all in the next hand with anything. But they are, they're, they're, they're deviating from their game in some way as a response to something, right? So firstly, you have to find out what that is and what the trigger of that is and like what is is underneath that. So like a, a super common thing is like um, that, again, is is still has its own individual character to it. But a common one is like people wanting to make calls. They want to call people. Why? Because they don't want to be bluffed, because what if their opponent is bluffing? So what's so bad about that? What if their opponent is bluffing? Like, how do you, how do you like really get in there? Like, what's the worst thing that can happen if your opponent is bluffing? What, you suck, you're a loser, someone, someone owned you, you know, like, like you have to, you have to like really peel back the layers there. Like, and once people kind of start to remove the specter of what could happen to them if they're wrong or like what this means if someone got away with that or whatever. It, it's kind of along the lines of like what, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And, and you know, once you learn, you're not going to die from it. Once you bring it down into the immediate, okay, so what's the worst thing that can happen here? I can call here or I, excuse me, I can fold here and my opponent's going to say, look what I did to you and show you the bluff, right? That's the worst thing that can happen. So what is going to happen after that? You're going to lose the pot and you're going to move on to the next hand and you're going to feel kind of shitty and you're going to have this data and like that's it you're going to survive you're presumably playing a stake where that loss of that pod is not going to seriously affect you and so that's what that is the immediate nature but people don't they don't want to bring it into the immediate they want to keep it as this like amorphous kind of specter that and that is why that is what hijacks them that is what keeps this in this like fearful state so the more immediate you can bring this in into your experience the more you realize i can deal with this so what i have people do who have that particular problem you know i explain all the normal things which is like you know if you're calling if you're never getting bluffed you're calling too much like wouldn't you rather 
not pay off people nine out of 10 times and get plus one out of 10. You know, we, we talk about all that. But in terms of the experience, I find that it's really useful to have people deal with the worst case scenario in the moment. You know, like they, 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 they literally just talk to themselves. They say, okay, I could call here and, or, or sorry, I could fold here and, I'm, and I might be wrong. My opponent might show me a bluff. Here's how I'm gonna feel. Here's what, what's gonna happen there. Now that I've brought it into the immediate, in, into my immediate processing, I can now set that aside because I've dealt with it. I've now dealt with it. I can set it aside and I can focus on, on what is at hand rather than worrying about this thing that I, that I might possibly have to deal with. And, and that, that was like, that was really helpful to me as well because I wouldn't want to, especially when dealing with mistakes in general, you have to focus on what they feel like. You have to focus on what's going on. How does this feel to me? Like, I remember what, so, so to, I'll come back around, but what happened to me early on in my career was I thought everyone was bluffing me. And to be fair, like they were bluffing me a lot, but I thought people were, were always trying to see what they could get away with, right? <laughs> and I, I got caught up in this idea of like, oh, I'm a girl, they're gonna try to push me around, blah, blah, blah. And so I would keep, and, I, and it also felt so good to make a hero call, right? To just like <laughs> own someone with a hero call. So all of that converged, made me too loose. I was, I was calling too loose. And basically I would be in these situations where nobody had any reason to be bluffing me. I was established enough to where like people didn't think they could just push me around. And I would find myself latching on to this one thing of like, but what if they have the one hand? And then I'd have this out of body experience, like watching myself put the chips in the middle. And so, <laughs> so I was like, I have to stop this you know and so what I had to do is I had to pay really close attention to how that felt instead of like distancing myself from it like a trauma recall um, I would I was like okay what does this feel like where does the thought process start moving how does it feel physically like do I feel flush do I feel hot what's going on and so when I paid attention then the next step was recognizing it then I could recognize it when it was happening I didn't have a solution yet but I knew I was like oh it's happening again right now and then I, I did this, I started doing this thing that I learned um, from a psychology book called coupling, which is um, manually associating something with someone else, with something, something with something else, instead of what you normally associate with. Like the automatic coupling was, I'd think these things and have these feelings and put the chips in the middle, right? So I had to associate those feelings with something else, which was starting over starting over in my thought process, wherever I was, fuck it, let's start over from the very beginning. So not only was I able to identify when it was happening, but I was able to engineer a solution. So that attention piece is super important when, when dealing with people, because what you'll find is that most people just want to move on. Why did you do this? I don't know. I know better. You know, they don't want to explain. They don't want to get granular. They, they themselves don't want to dive in. So you dive in and then you have to kind of engineer a solution based on them, not based on you. You know, what do you think, if anything, you could have gotten you out of that moment? What could someone have said to you that, that might have given you a chance of getting out of there? What, what could you have responded to? And then they start thinking about like, well, what would I respond to, you know? And then we start actually implementing those as trials. And it, it doesn't really matter what they are. It doesn't matter how embarrassing it might be. It doesn't matter if you'd be like, well, I wish I didn't have to like listen to the theme song from Barney to get me untilted. Like that's so lame, but, but who cares? Like as long as, as long as it's what, what does it for you. And for me, um, I had a friend, a uh, longtime friend in poker who I always knew would just kind of like make me feel better, make me laugh. Like poker is a very solitary, it's a lonely kind of thing. And um, I would text this guy and I'd send him a picture of the table and he'd make up stories about all the dumb things that everyone else was thinking and doing and whatever. And it would just like take the edge off and it would make me feel like someone's on my side. And I was able to just like get right back into the game. So do I wish that I didn't need that as a professional? Do I wish I could just like snap my fingers and, and play a game every time? Sure. Does it matter? Is it better that I have a solution that I know I can count on that takes me out of whatever suboptimal mental game I'm in and brings me right back? Absolutely. So we, we do a lot of trial and error that, but you can't, you can't find a solution, you can't engineer a solution unless you pay a lot of attention to what is happening to you in the moment, which people are, it's tough, it's, it's tough to do. I wanna talk about our biggest disagreement, which okay. is, Hit me. so the dating thing, and even we disagree pretty wildly, but we're willing enough to have an open, open dialogue about this. 
Yeah, so we were talking together, and I've been deal. I've done with. I've dealt with a lot of people in the dating world. One conclusion that I personally come to is that dating is just like, it's just, it's just totally out of whack because we've been effectively hypersexualized, um, and now like secretly, lust kind of controls everything. Secretly, lust has every has has lust has been the prime controller of everything for everything for millennia. I don't. I don't think this is new. I don't think this is new at all. Well, well, I think that's not a hundred percent true. I mean, definitely, it's it's positive component, uh, whatever it looks like, uh, love. But in this case, I'm referring specifically to its overextension to where it becomes unhealthy. For example, um, just like where if it's the case where everything in the world has to like, you know, bend to the will of you know having sex. Uh, that doesn't seem like a healthy um, situation, but I think Paris uh, said something about that. Like, imagine huh? being carried along every day by just like the whims of sex. Um, but, but I, but I, I do think it's it's true for the majority. Anyway, yeah, of course it's very true for a lot of people, and I mean it's all over like music and culture and things like that. Mm-hmm.